My name is Naveen Jain, and uh, like was mentioned, I'm at the University of Pennsylvania working in the lab of Dr. Arjun Raj. Thank you for letting me speak today about my project, which is focused on studying this process by which we can reprogram somatic cells into induced pluripotent stem cells or iPSCs. And I'll also be talking about some cool technologies we have that allow us to connect phenotypic fate with initial cell state. Um, you know, I'm kind of a last minute person, so some of these slides are switched up from what might have gone out earlier, uh, so please bear with me. And uh, also my second monitor is over here, so I'll be looking over here, but I promise you I'm, I'm looking at you in spirit. And so before I kind of jump into my project in full, I just wanted to kind of give some context that this work is part of a larger effort and grant that's focused on trying to understand the time scales under which uh, genome looping interactions might change as cells undergo changes in phenotype or cell state. And so as part of this grant, uh, you know, lots of researchers are looking at different systems uh, whereby cells are changing phenotype on different time scales. And in particular, uh, mine is part of like the section where we're focusing on longer time scales uh, during which somatic cells are reprogramming into iPSCs. And this kind of work very broadly is trying to create a functional link between loop interaction frequency and gene expression, which in a lot of cases is still kind of unclear in the field. Um, in terms of kind of major questions that uh, this work is trying to ask by using quantitative methods and new techniques, uh, those questions include, how does looping interaction frequency change with different time scales as cells undergo these changes? And you know, to what extent can we connect looping interaction frequency with changes in gene expression? And so uh, truth be told, I'll only really be focusing on looping interactions when discussing future considerations for what I'll be presenting. Uh, so you can look forward to that uh, near the end of the talk. And so to jump into it, uh, you know, stem cells hold a lot of promise for a variety of different applications, such as regenerative medicine, as well as drug development. And a very powerful discovery, uh, you know, made a few years ago was that you can reprogram, uh, you know, multiple different starting somatic cell types into induced pluripotent stem cells or iPSCs via the addition of uh, these exogenous transcription factors, most famously the Yamanaka factors of OCT4, SOX2, KLF4, and MYC, which from here on out, I'll be kind of referring to and on my slides as OKSM. And what these transcription factors kind of very broadly do is they, you know, bind uh, at regulatory elements and cause changes in gene expression that cause a inactivation of somatic genes and an activation of pluripotent genes as you move from somatic cells to stem cells. Um, I won't go into a lot of detail, but this is also this process is also associated with large changes in genome rearrangements. For example, uh, movement of somatic genes from the A compartment associated with active transcription to the B compartment associated with uh, inactive transcription and vice versa for pluripotent genes. And so this process is, is really great, but you know, there's a reason why we don't currently have the ability to you know, just create organs already for regenerative medicine. And that's because this process is extremely inefficient. And so if you start with a single cell and allow it to divide to create a population of genetically identical cells, when you actually induce expression of the OKSM, only a very small fraction of these cells actually go on to form iPSCs, usually less than 1%. And this kind of uh, is, you know, begs the fundamental question that we're trying to answer with this project, which is, you know, what is different about these rare subsets or in this particular case, this red cell that enabled it to become an iPSC when exposed to OKSM when the rest of its neighbors did not. And kind of a cool nuance here is, you know, all of these cells are genetically identical. And that kind of implies that there's some other source of heterogeneity or non-genetic heterogeneity that might be driving these differences. So in terms of thinking about these differences in the field, there's been a variety of observations and models proposed. Uh, and, you know, some people have observed that, you know, given a population of cells, given enough prolonged exposure to OKSM, each of those cells is inherently capable of becoming an iPSC. This seems to be in direct contrast to observations, on the contrary, perhaps, that uh, even though this might be true, only a rare subset seems to drive a majority of the reprogramming activity in like a given population. In addition to these observations, there's been a lot of work done in our lab in the context of studying drug resistance and melanoma, 
that have found that there are the existence of these dynamic yet heritable cell states that can drive phenotypes. And by cell state here, I mean single cell differences in chromatin state, gene expression, and protein signaling between otherwise genetically identical cells. So kind of taking all these observations together, we can kind of propose a, the following model, which might explain what differentiates these cells that are able to form iPSCs. And so if we start with a population of cells, there's only a small subset of that population that is poised to become an iPSC. And those are cells that have this red, what we'll call primed cell state. Uh, one kind of unique feature of this model is that we expect that this prime state is dynamic, such that uh, you know, as time passes, different cells might exit or enter that prime state. And so in this example, we have this red cell here that started in the prime state, but after some time has left that prime state, whereas this cell next to it has then entered the prime state after that time. Then when we add OKSM, only the cells that are currently in the prime state actually go on to form iPSCs. And so this model is really nice because it's something that we kind of observe in the cancer system, but also can help explain these observations in that every cell could theoretically be capable of reprogramming by virtue of the fact that every cell might be able to enter the prime state through these transient fluctuations. However, whatever subset has it at the time at which you add OKSM is the subset that's going to go on to produce most of the reprogramming activity. And so kind of with all of this in mind, the first questions we wanted to ask was, is there evidence that this state exists? And also how dynamic is this state? If these transient fluctuations happened on too short of a time scale, it would be impossible to capture or measure the state even if it did exist. And so in order to do that, we used a lineage barcoding system developed by a former graduate student in the lab, Dr. Ben Emmert. And this barcoding system has barcodes in the three prime UTR of GFP. And really importantly, this means that these barcodes, when you transduce them, exist both as DNA and RNA, which enables us to detect them by a variety of modalities, which I'll kind of get into in a little bit. In addition, we used a human fibroblast system that has a stably integrated OKSM cassette, which allows us to minimize technical noise and induce OKSM by adding doxycycline, which is really convenient for the question that we're studying. And so we can start with a population of these cells and transduce them such that each cell gets a unique barcode that marks that cell and that lineage. We can then allow those cells to divide to create what we'll refer to as twins, with kind of the logic here being that twin cells are going to be sharing their cell state. We can then separate those, those twins into different populations and reprogram them by activating uh, OKSM by adding doxycycline. And then using DNA sequencing, we can get the barcodes in those iPSC colonies to get a sense of which lineages were primed to form iPSCs. And so using an approach like this, we might expect a variety of different outcomes depending on the dynamics of the prime state and how it impacts reprogramming potential. And so if this process was purely stochastic, as some people in the field have proposed, given the extremely low frequency of turning from a somatic cell into an iPSC, we would expect that in the final population of iPSCs, there'd be kind of no overlap between the lineages. However, if it was at least somewhat deterministic, we would expect that there would be some partial overlap in those barcodes, or even perhaps complete overlap of those barcodes in the iPSCs. And what we actually find when we do this experiment is the middle case, where there's evidence of partial memory. And this is really important because it indicates that whatever dictates your repro reprogramming success, it's established before we split the cells and before we add OKSM. In addition, the fact that we view partial memory is either indicative of the dynamic nature of the prime state, as we kind of you know, mentioned in our original model, or could be due to technical noise in our system. However, we and a variety of others have already have you know, very robustly demonstrated that at the very least, there's partial memory that indicates that this process is not purely stochastic. And so kind of the next thing that we wanted to ask after that was to figure out if the differences driving these differences in reprogramming outcomes were due to biological differences or you know, perhaps an artifact of the system. Uh, so if you'll remember, we use a fibroblast line with an integrated OKSM cassette. But some people in the field have kind of proposed that you know, maybe what is driving this is that there are certain cells that have leaky OKSM expression even before the addition of doxycycline. And so in order to measure this, we use a similar setup where we barcoded cells, allowed them to divide into twins, 
split those twins, uh, but this time, instead of reprogramming both of those twins uh, independently, we only reprogram one of the arms. With the other arm, we fix it at the time of the split, which kind of preserves all the information about those cells at that time period and serves as an effective what I'll call carbon copy. With the upper arm, we can then reprogram into iPSCs and then use DNA sequencing to get the barcodes. But uh, you know, it, very importantly, because these barcodes also exist as mRNA, we can design fish probes and then go back to this carbon copy using those barcode fish probes to specifically mark the colonies or, or the cells that went on to form iPSC colonies. Then we can use imaging such as RNA fish in order to look at gene expression to compare differences between prime cells and non-prime cells in the initial population. And to kind of show you what that looks like, which is really cool, uh, if we start off you know, with a well of thousands and thousands of cells, when we add our barcode fish probes, we can clearly mark cells uh, here, as shown here, that uh, were primed to become iPSCs. And part of this is facilitated by using a combination of barcode fish, but also a signal amplification scheme called hybridization chain reaction or HCR, which enables us to find these, you know, quote unquote, needles in a haystack at lower magnification to increase our throughput. And so once we clearly label the cells that are primed, we can then use RNA fish to ask about what are differences in their gene expression. And so the first thing that we looked at was just purely if there was differences in expression of the OKSM uh, genes. And what we see is that that's largely not the case. And so here on these graphs over here, Every dot represents a single cell. And then every, the y-axis here is the amount of RNA counts in those cells for the given gene. Uh, so as you can see for OCT4 and SOX2, uh, for comparing the primed or red cells and the non-primed and white cells, there are no significant differences, which indicates that whatever is driving these reprogramming variability is not just a system artifact, but perhaps due to some deeper biological variability. And so this is a really powerful tool that enables us to identify and characterize these prime cells, but we can only look at a handful of genes at a time, and it also depends on our knowledge beforehand of what genes we want to look at. And so in order to get an unbiased genome-wide uh, understanding of what might differentiate prime versus non-prime cells, we developed a technique that kind of uh, combines single-cell RNA sequencing and our lineage barcodes in order to uh, make those comparisons, which I'll walk through now. And so this technique was developed in the lab largely by uh, a postdoc, Dr. Yogesh Goyal, with help from uh, a graduate student named Connie Jung. And it uses a similar kind of method as we've shown before. So we take our population, we barcode it, uh, we allow the cells to divide into twins. But this time with the carbon copy, instead of fixing it, we immediately put it in the 10x pipeline in order to get single cell transcriptome information for all the cells in the initial population. Then using some tricks, we can take some cDNA from that pipeline because the barcodes are expressed as mRNA, and we can specifically amplify and sequence those barcodes in order to get lineage barcode information and connect it with the 10x cell IDs. This enables us on the UMAP, for instance, to specifically color in for individual cells their barcode lineage information. Finally, with the other split, which we reprogram into iPSCs, we can collect the barcodes again and find out which are the prime lineages and then add that final layer of information to specifically know not only which cells have barcodes, but which correspond to prime lineages. And so these are very preliminary results, which I'll just you know, very briefly walk you through. But when we do that, uh, you know, we were able to get about 13,000 cells from uh, the initial population that kind of you know, cluster in various ways. We we're able to get some subset of those cells to you know, connect them explicitly to uh, lineage barcodes. And from there, we are able to pick up uh, about 31 cells from the initial population that were primed or poised to become iPSCs upon adding uh, OKSM. And so, like I mentioned before, this is very preliminary data, uh, but kind of future work is focused on trying to identify gene expression differences in these cells, as well as to validate those before moving on to uh, more rigorous experiments, which I'll kind of talk briefly about uh, in a little bit. And so to kind of, you know, uh, to kind of summarize everything that I've talked about today, we've proposed a model by which there are dynamic prime cell states that, you know, take into account many previous observations in the field to help explain 
why certain cells go on to form iPSCs upon exposure to OKSM. Uh, we've kind of demonstrated along with others that this process is not purely stochastic because sister cells, which theoretically share cell state, more often than you would expect by random chance, share reprogramming outcomes. In addition, we've demonstrated that these prime states are heritable cross cell divisions, which enables us to do some of the comparisons that I've demonstrated in previous experiments. In addition, we've shown that through a combination of 10x uh, single cell RNA sequencing, as well as lineage barcoding, we can specifically identify these prime cells in the initial population with single cell transcriptome information and measure gene expression differences with non-prime cells. And finally, we've demonstrated how at least in this system, OKSM expression pre-induction is not driving these differences in reprogramming outcomes, which is likely due to biological variability. And so just to briefly touch on a couple other future directions, uh, like I mentioned before, kind of our goal right now is to identify and validate potential markers that characterize the prime state. But once we have those, you can imagine doing a variety of different experiments to kind of characterize how looping interactions might play a key role in regulating both the prime state as well as IPSC reprogramming potential during the reprogramming process. And so, for example, you could imagine a scenario where you start with a population of these cells using the prime state markers. You can then sort on those cells in order to separate primed and non-prime cells and use techniques like 5C in order to specifically identify loops that might distinguish primed from non-prime cells in the initial population particularly around genes that we think might be important for priming, as well as the reprogramming process. Then you can imagine using techniques such as ladle, developed by the uh, Jennifer Phillips Kremens lab, in order to engineer any putative loops that we think might be important in these processes. So that might look like engineering loops to resemble the prime state or disrupting loops that we think are important for the prime state and see what impact, if any, that might have on reprogramming efficiency overall. And so uh, this is all work that I'm really excited to do in the coming few months. And with that, I'd like to thank all of you for you know, paying attention as well as giving me this opportunity to speak today and to thank a lot of people in the lab for helping get this work off the ground. Uh, in particular, the people in bold here who've really contributed a lot uh, in helping develop this technique.